Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time and I'm here to give you four tips on deciding which medicinal herbs are going to be best for you to grow. Because we hear all these great things about all these different herbs, but you know, the reality is, depending on our location and how much space we have, we simply can't grow them all. So, and guess what? There's many herbs that can be good for the same thing, which is why I put together lists, which I'll link to that full playlist down below, where I'll have a list of herbs and more that are good for pain and a list of herbs and more that are good for digestive health and so much more. So the whole purpose of me putting together those lists is not so people can run out and try to grow or buy all of those herbs, but so they can realize how many different options there are. So, how do you figure out what's best for you? Well, it should start off with you getting yourself a good uh, book that is tailored to your region or location. Like there's one specifically for Australia, pretty much that whole area. There's a big book. Somebody actually sent it to me, and it's a great book. And I'll put a picture of it here. And I also have a book about medicinal herbs for the Pacific Northwest. So it's gonna cover all the herbs that would grow that are good for medicinal purposes wild in our area. And then your location, you're getting even smaller, can be even different yet than that area, but at least having something that's for your general area is gonna be a really good way to start. Because the truth is, there's going to be medicinal herbs that just grow wild here like sting and nettle can grow wild here. Sting and nettle loves any place that is more damp and cool and lots of cloud cover. Then if you live in a really hot, dry climate, it's probably not going to do well. It's not that you can't grow it there, but you might have to struggle and find out what's going to work best to be able to get it to grow at all. So, and then there's just some herbs that will absolutely not grow in certain climates. That's no matter what you do, you know, so getting a good book at least to start with. And then if, and when you're able, go out and see if you can find these things growing wild in your area. Or if you know that it generally grows well in your climate, then that can be something that you may want to consider growing in your garden. Which, by the way, I'll link to that Pacific Northwest book down below. If you go through that link and you live in another region around the U.S., you'll be able to find more books. They should show you either at the top or the bottom somewhere other books that are within that series that are about different areas around the U.S. So you can be at least a little more specific about the types of wild herbs you're looking for because that's gonna be the best way. That's something that you know you know is gonna grow well, especially if it's a wild herb. You know, dandelion, most people can find growing in their area. Plantain, most people can find growing in their area. And they both of those have a lot of great uses. So it's then also about learning about them. Tip number two is I suggest before even considering getting serious about filling up your garden with certain herbs, maybe see if you can sample some, if they're the type of herb that's available in a dried form and using it in medicinal forms, be it using it to make a salve, using it to make tinctures, using it to make teas, and see how you or your family reacts to that, how well they can handle it, um, and knowing what your natural allergies are, because these are going to be things that are gonna affect which herbs you should grow. Because some people shouldn't, should stay away from pretty much all asters. You know, that would be uh, marigolds, feverfew, dandelion, uh, calendula, and more, because it's the biggest flower family. But they can handle things like plantain and other types of herbs, comfrey, and so much more. So you got to you got to understand what's going to be right for you because if you're allergic to it or maybe you're on certain medications that you can't go off of or you need to be able to wean yourself off of there are certain herbs you should not combine with certain medications and certain other underlying issues that it, they could possibly make worse. So you got to do your homework on each one and take that personal responsibility. You know, you can't expect everybody to tell you. I mean, I can get up, I can make my videos and tell you what works best for me, but that does not automatically mean you should run out 
and start taking that. You need to find out if it's right for you. Even doctors, when they prescribe a medication, a lot of it is guesswork. It may or be, may not be based on medications you're already on, your allergies, or underlying conditions. Sometimes they don't even bother to see what other medications you are on before they start piling more on top of you, or even if they know that, they have no proof of what combining these two medications together are going to do. So you become a guinea pig in all sides. You got to take personal responsibility to learn about it yourself and listen to your body. So yes, sampling some, uh, a lot of times when I buy herbs, I buy them in bulk because that's the cheapest way to get it. A lot of, um, I more and more get my herbs now from Azure Standard, which is always linked in my description box down below. I just got some ashwagandha root in. That's something that's been very helpful in many ways. More and more herbs, but if that doesn't work for you, Frontier Co-op is a good place. Uh, uh, and yes, they sell on Amazon. They also sell on Vitacost. I tend to find that Amazon carries more of their herbs for a pretty decent price. Now, why Vitacost is a great place to get vitamins, herbs, and so much more for a really great price. I do find that Amazon, so I'll be putting the Amazon link to the Frontier Co-op store, and I trust that brand. They have a lot of great products. They put a lot more of their products on Amazon than they do on Vitacost and other such places that I've seen. So I'll give you that link below as well as the Azure Standard. Those are my two fa favorite places. Now, some people ask me about Mountain Rose Herbs. I have my reasons why I don't buy from them anymore. I did years ago until they did something that goes really strongly against my moral stance on certain things that I decided that um, despite the fact that a lot of people told them, please don't go this route, they did it anyway. And I decided, you know, you're not going to listen to, you know, the people who really love your company and want to keep supporting you, then I'm just not interested in supporting you any longer. So if you would like to know more about that, you can email me and at raincountryhomestead gmail.com and I'll share with that. I just don't feel comfortable sharing all that here in a video, but that's my personal choice. Regardless of that, I will say they do carry great quality herbs. But um, Azure Standard has really great prices on their herbs. I found um, their ashwagandha is just a great price. I just bought it. It's the best price I've seen on one pound bag of ashwagandha root. Point number three, and that is, I kind of touched on this earlier, and it's also considering the amount of space you have to work with. If you're trying to do it all in a shy one-third acre piece of property that your house and your shop and your chickens and all your fruit and vegetable plants are growing on, you, you may need to really limit and be more selective of the herbs that you're going to put in. If you have lots of acreage to work with, then you can try as many different herbs as you want. And just keep in mind, and this goes into point four, on which herbs are going to be highly invasive. Comfrey, even if you get the varieties that do not produce seed, they still will propagate through their roots and spread everywhere. And for a lot of people, they might be fine with that because comfrey is an amazing herb. And I don't mind it, I just dig up the excess plants as they come in. I have the same problem with nettle, but I just dig up and pull back and cut back the excess as it's coming in. If you keep up on it, it's usually not so bad. Peppermint is another one that can be rather invasive. I am glad that it is because I love peppermint. However, there's certain up, uh, herbs, you know, plantain and feverfew can spread all over the place, as does marshmallow. Again, I'm not that, I don't mind that quite so much, but I get it coming up everywhere. So it's just a matter, is it going to be worth it to you whether you have a big area or a small area for that plant to be invasive. Even if you have a big area, you might find that certain things like plantain can take over a whole section in pretty short order, as can comfrey and sting and nettle. So these are the other things. So that again, that's point number four that you need to kind of weigh out and learn about before you select that specific herb for your area. So typically when I do videos like this, I have five points. I only had four today. However, I am sure there's many out there that have some more points that they could add to my list. So please put those in comments down below. And also, um, before I close out, I almost forgot to say, I have a video 
on my top favorite herbs. I usually do one every one or two years. I'll link to my most recent one in the description box down below. And thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.